So, we will continue our discussion on non collusive oligopoly model in also in this uh, session. So, if you remember in the last class, uh, we uh, discussed about the Connaught models, and Connaught models typically a duopoly market situation where the basic um, uh, characteristic is that it operates in zero cost of production, and that is why we get a marginal cost which is equal to zero. And here, even if the firm they know that they are interdependent on each other, but when they fix their output, when they fix their price, they are not taking the, not taking into consideration the uh, what will be the rivals plan on the basis of their revised plan. And that is the reason, if you remember in the last class, we discussed a situation when in the period they uh, one fourth of one fourth of the market remain. Uh, unexplored no one produced in that one fourth market the rest three fourth market is got produced by both the firms A and B. So, we will continue our discussion on the Connaught model we will see that how the equilibrium uh, solution can be achieved or how the equilibrium uh, can be achieved with the reaction and action patterns of the uh, reaction and action pattern of the uh, two firms. So, in the last class if you remember we talked about a situation where uh, the three fourth uh, of the market generally so in that case uh, so if you remember then a b together they were just producing three fourth of the market and one fourth was not uh, produce either by firm a or firm b at least in the first period now uh, what will happen in period 2 so this in the first case Three fourth was produced together by A and B, and one fourth was not. Now, how it will happen in period two? Firm A assume that B just going to produce one fourth of it, okay, and he will feel that three fourth is his own market, typically for a firm A. So, if three fourth is his own market, now generally he producing only half of it. So, he will produce half of three fourth in the market and that will come to uh, three eighth of total market. So, A is going to produce three eighth of total market. A assume that B just going to produce one fourth of the market. So, A will think that he just going to produce only three fourth or uh, the rest three fourth is his own market and he since A produce only half of the total market in this case the half of total market is half multiplied by, multiplied by three four and that comes to three by eight as the total market. Now, we will see how B is going to react to this. Okay. So, B will consider that uh, again when it comes to B, what will be the assumption for B? The assumption for B is A will continue to produce 3 eighth of the market. Means, what is the market available for B? The remaining market that is less by 3 by 8. So, this is 1 by 3 8 is the market available to B. Now, B will produce again half of this because half of 1 by 1 minus 3 by 8. So, this is 5 by 16. So, A is going to produce 3 by 8 and B is grow going to produce 5 by 16. Now, this action reaction pattern continues firm always assume that a always assume that B is going to produce half and uh, from B is go always going to assume that A is going to produce half. So, they take out that half and they feel that the rest of the market whatever they could produce and again it comes the half of the total market demand. So, this action reaction pattern for firm A and B will continue. Now, what is the outcome of this action reaction pattern of firm A and B? So, it's, it just goes on with the uh, share that is half of share half of the total market except the share of mar A for B and half of the total market except the share of B for A. So, this action reaction will continue. So, in this action reaction generally share of A goes on decreasing and share of B goes on increasing and 
this will lead to a situation where each firm supplies to an equal market that is one third of the total market. Okay. So, this uh, if you look at initially the share of A was higher than share of B. So, this action reaction pattern will continue and with the action reaction pattern finally, each firm will reach to a situation where they are just producing one third of the total market and remaining uh, this one third of total market is produced by A, one third of total market is produced by B and remaining one third is not getting produced either by A or, or by B. So, we will just uh, take the graph to understand this that how this reach to a situation where they just produce one third, one third and leads to a uh, case where rest one third is remain on produce either by A and B. So, if you remember your uh, reaction function R 1, R 1 dash is the reaction function of form A, R 2, R 2 dash is the reaction function of form B. So, ideally this should be the situation where this is the amount of Q 1, this is the amount of Q 2. Q 1 is produced by A, Q 2 is produced by B. Now, how they reach to this Q 1 A to Q 1 B? It is not they start from here, rather they start from here and what is this uh, R 1 days here? At this point, the total market demand is we can say O R 2 days is the total market uh, demand. So, out of this initially A will just produce this much and from there actually this action reaction pattern happens. So, if this A, A is producing this corresponding to this B will produce here that is the reaction curve of B. R 2 R 2 days is the reaction comes of, uh, curve function of B, R 1 R 1 is the reaction curve function of A. So, if you look at if initially A produce this much, now with reaction to this B will produce uh, take a point corresponding to this in the reaction function of B that is R 2 R 2 days. Corresponding to this again A will react to this and choose a combination where in the reaction function of A. And if you remember what is reaction function, reaction function gives the different quantity of Q 1 and Q 2 combination of Q 1 and Q 2 where profit is maximum. So, whether B chooses any combination in reaction function 2, A chooses any combination in reaction function 1, ideally they maximize the profit. So, to start with they will do with this with A start with this point corresponding to this B choose a combination over here. Now, suppose this is combination 1, then this is combination 2 again chosen by A with respect to with the reaction to a combination B by this 1. Then corresponding to this again B will choose a combination here and uh, corresponding to this A will choose a combination here. Then corresponding to this again B will choose a combination here and here A will choose a combination here this action reaction will continue till the time they are not reaching this point E and after reaching the point E, they generally they reach the equilibrium solution where A produce Q 1 unit of output and B produce Q 2 unit of output. So, graphically how we reach the Carnot's equilibrium? We reach the Carnot's equilibrium through the reaction function approach. We take the reaction function 1, reaction function 2 and the reaction of both the firms get captured in their own reaction function and finally, eventually this reaction action pattern leads them to the equilibrium where they this is generally stable and after that at least in that time period again the reaction action pattern never continue. Then we will see um, the detailed description that how this one third of this total uh, uh, total market uh, output comes to form 1, we will just take period wise that how this finally it comes to one third for form A and one third for form B. So, if you uh, generally we will just take a uh, 
uh, form of equation in order to understand this. So, period 1 okay, we will see what is form A, what is form B. So, form A is half of total market. So, this is half form B is half of half market that is A share that comes to one fourth. Then period 2, what will be for form A? Half of 1 minus 1 four, 1 four is the B share that comes to 3 by 8. Then what will be for form B? that is half of 1 minus 3 by 8 that comes to 5 by 16. Now, what will be in period 3? Form A that is uh, half of 1 minus 5 by 16, this is B share that comes to 11 by 32. So, this is B share 1 minus this half of it going to be produced by form A, form B again half of 1 minus uh, 11 by 32, this is share of A. So, this comes to uh, 21 by 6, 4 then we will talk about period 4 output of form A and form B. So, this is nothing but just taking the share and making a half of it, but eventually we will see how they just produce uh, one third of the total output. So, for period 4 this is again half of 1 minus 11 by 32. So, that comes to sorry 1 minus uh, 21 by 64. So, that comes to 43 divided by 128 and form B again half by 1 minus 43 by 128. So, that comes to 85 by 256. Now, this continue till the time period n. So, we will see how what will be the value in period n because n takes any number. So, it is 1 to n. So, in period n what will be the share of form A and form B? Eventually, it is form A half by 1 minus 1 by 3. So, that comes to 1 by 3 and form B half of 1 by 1 minus 3 that is coming to 1 by 3. Now, what is A's equilibrium output now? A's equilibrium output will be half minus 1 by 8 by 1 by 1 minus 4. So, that comes to half minus 1 by 8 by 3 by 4, which comes to 8 by 24 and 1 by 3. This is form B A A forms A equilibrium output. Similarly, we will find form B's equilibrium output. So, form B is equilibrium output 1 4 by 1 minus 1 4. So, this is 1 by 4 divided by 3 by 4 which comes to 1 by uh, 1 by 3 
and for n number of farm what will be the industry output and what will be the farms output industry output will be uh, n by n plus 1 or to uh, uh, again describe this this is e is equal to 1 summation e 1 to n 1 by n plus 1 and what will be the individual firms output n 1 by n plus 1 this will be the individual firms output both for a and b. So, uh, ideally what we want to check over here, we want to check over here is that when the action reaction pattern happens, they assume the same behavior from other farms and that is why they if you find some of this which remain unutilized that is not being produced either by farm A or farm B and that is why they are just producing one third of the total output of the market and remaining one third is not being produced either by A and B. Next, we will say, we will just take an example to understand this Connert model, we will just take a numerical to understand the uh, Connert's model then and then we will move into the next model that is Stackelberg model and Paul Swiggy King demand curve model. So, P is equal to 100 minus 0 0.5 x this is the uh, demand function. This is cost function of farm A, which is uh, uh, it is a constant cost function. For farm B, it is the increasing cost function. We need to find out the profit maximizing level of output for both the farm A and B. Okay. And how we will find out this? We generally uh, take the profit maximizing rule that is marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So, what is this P? P we can simplify this as 0, um, 100 minus 0 0.5 x A plus x b because this x is the total output is the summation of output of a and b and what will be the profit of a what will the profit of farm a that is uh, total revenue minus total cost and what is uh, total revenue over here. So, total revenue minus total cost will give us the profit of a. So, this is P x A, this is the output, this is the price minus 5 x A, this is the cost function of the uh, uh, farm A. So, what is P x A? That is 100 minus 0 0.5 uh, that is x. So, this is x A plus x B multiplied by x a minus 5 x a. So, this is cost function, this is p and this is x a. So, if you simplify this then it comes to uh, 100 x a minus 0 0.5 x a square plus sorry if you open the bracket this is minus plus uh, minus 0 0.5 x a x b minus 5 x a. Simplifying this again this is 95 x a because this 5 x a will get deducted from here minus uh, 0 0.5 x a square minus 0 0.5 x a and x b. Simplifying this 95 minus x a minus 0 0.5 uh, x b 
is equal to 0. So, this is our marginal uh, that is our uh, this profit. So, this comes to marginal revenue equal to minus marginal cost has to be equal to 0. So, this is 95 if you take the derivative then this comes to 95 this comes to x a this comes to 0 0.5 x b. Okay. So, if you simplify this in term of x a this comes as a 95 minus 0 0.5 uh, x b and what is this x a in term of x b this is the reaction function of a this is the reaction function of a. Similarly, we will find the reaction function of b and if you remember what is the reaction function of a this combination gives the maximum level of profit to the firm a. Similarly, we will now find it for b. So, if you simplify this for x b we get it is 50 minus 0 0.25 x a. So, I am not just doing a detailed calculation for b you need to follow the same formula to find out the what we did for a the same formula to find out the reaction curve function for b. Basically, you need to find out the pi then you to maximize it pi is the difference between total revenue total cost you need to maximize this and then solve for the value in term of uh, x b in term of x a and that will give us the reaction curve function for uh, reaction curve function for b. Now, to find this uh, value of x a and x b we need to uh, need to put the reaction curve of uh, reaction reaction curve function of b in a and reaction and we can solve the value for x a. So, in this case we can find out x b is equal to 50 minus 0 0.25 x a. So, now what we will do we will uh, put the value of x a in order to solve for x b. So, this is equal to 50 minus 0 0.25 by 95 minus 0 0.5 x b. So, that comes to 50 minus 23.75 plus 0 0.125 x b. So, solving for this x b will be equal to 30 x a is equal to 80 and putting a value of x a and x b that is uh, 80 plus 30 that comes to 120 and putting the value of this we will get the value of p which is equal to 45. So, this is the output of uh, the b this is the output of a and this is the profit maximizing level of output of a and b using the Carnot model or generally using the reaction curve approach. So, what we discuss in case of uh, Carnot model this is a typical situation where uh, two firms engage with each other they know the interdependence, but they are not considering the uh, fact that they are interdependent to each other in order to decide the output plan. And that is the reason th when they are revising their plan they are not considering the what will be the rivals reaction to the revised plan and ultimately they are reaching to a equilibrium which is stable, but in that case they are not exploring the output for the entire the market. And here we take the um, assumption that there is zero cost of production and we also discuss in case of Carnot model that when we assume the zero cost and there is a linear demand curve the output of perfect the output of monopoly is half of competitive output and the duopoly output is the two third of competitive output. So, to summarize this uh, h per Connet solution equilibrium is stable and each firm will be maximizing profit by selling equal amount of output at the same price. So, price same they are uh, selling the equal amount of output like one third one third of the total market and equilibrium is reached when both the firm earns maximum profit and have no tendency to change their output. 
Then we will uh, uh, take the case of another non collusive model that is generally known as the Stackelberg model and this is the extension of the Carnot model and this is popularly known as the leader follower model and uh, here one player is sufficiently sophisticated to recognize that the rival firms act according to Carnot assumption. So, here one player they feel that okay, they recognize that okay, rival firms uh, what is the rival firms reaction and what assumption they are taking when they are uh, finding uh, when they are revising their output plan. So, this sophisticated firm when they recognize that what will be the rival's plan or what is the reaction curve of the rival, they also able to incorporate that in their own profit function, because they know now what is the reaction curve function of the rival. They act as a monopolist, the naive firm will uh, act as a follower. So, here how it is different from the Carnot model? Here in the in, in case of Carnot model, when the firm they were deciding about the output plan, they were not considering the reaction reaction function of the other firm. But in case of uh, this Stackelberg model, they consider this uh, reaction at least one of the firm who is sophisticated enough to understand or identify the reaction uh, reaction function of the other firm, and they incorporate that in the profit function. And that firm who has identified this, they generally act as the leader, and the other act, uh, the, uh, the other firms act as a follower. And that's why it is also known as the leader-follower model. This typical Stackelberg model. Both the firms is in equilibrium because they are uh, maximizing the profit. Uh, okay, before going into this uh, equilibrium. Um, we will see that uh, ideally graphically how they uh, reach to this equilibrium. So, this is the reaction curve of firm A and this is the reaction curve function of firm B. Okay. Now, this is the point where both the okay. So, this is the iso profit uh, and this is another iso profit for B. So, this is okay, this is uh, x dash B and this is x dash a. Similarly, this is the iso profit function for a. No, this is also uh, this is iso profit, uh, iso profit function of b. So, this is also the iso profit function of a. This is a, this is b. Okay. So, R B is the firm's B reaction function, R A is the firm A reaction function. Now, corresponding to this here we have X A and here we have X B. Okay. E is the equilibrium output. Okay. Now, let assume that A firm A is sophisticated enough and they operate in Typically, this R A R R A E R A because this is their reaction curve function, and they will produce A, which is profit maximizing because the iso profit curve is also in the reaction curve function. Now, now in this case, A will produce O X A, and B will produce O X B. In this case, A is the leader and B is the follower. Now, suppose we will take the turn we will uh, uh, suppose B is the sophisticated firm over here. What is the reaction function uh, approach? The reaction function is again R B E is the reaction function uh, reaction function for firm B. It is equilibrium at the point B. So, B will produce O x B dash and firm uh, A will produce O x dash A. So, if you look at 
whoever is sophisticated they are uh, producing more who is they are the leader whoever is not uh, uh, sophisticated their follower they are generally paying uh, they are producing less like in case of uh, in the first case uh, b is producing less a is producing more and in the second case b is producing more since b is the leader and a is producing less now till the time the situation in one of them is leader the other is follower or the reverse may happen that b is the leader and a is the follower they will uh, just uh, the output will change because they are sophisticated now what happens when both of them they becomes sophisticated price war will continue what is the outcome price war will continue but price war is also not beneficial for the oligopolies that also they know so initially when both of them they will be trying to sophisticate the sophisticated they will be trying to be the leader in the market initially price war will continue but when they realize that price war is not going to benefit them rather price war is going to benefit the consumer they will stop over there or they will stabilize price over there and then finally they get into the cartel so stekelberg model says what stekelberg model says that it is always profitable if one of them is leader the other followers till the time the follower is also getting their share of profit and their share of output but uh, the uh, the question is that it will not continue for long run because if one firm is getting more profit because he knows that what is the reaction pattern of the other firm the other firms will also to try to do it that in the long run and eventually both of them they were trying to be the leader and that will lead to the price war and finally it's a cartel so uh, the end outcome when you think about the end uh, outcome of a stekelberg model still it is not determined fully that what should be the end outcome where they should stop so when it comes to monopolies both the firm, uh, this typically the stepolist both the firms in equilibrium because they are maximizing their profit and have no tendency to change the output typically in the graph if you have seen at the point e and equilibrium is reached when each firm is able to assess the other output correctly and this is achieved after a series of change in the output by each firm in the anticipation of other outputs remaining unchanged like in the previous case in case of connaught model we are discussing the action reaction pattern of both the firms finally take them to the equilibrium and the same thing happen in case of stekelberg model also equilibrium is reached when each firm is able to assess the other output correctly and this is not happened once this generally happens after the action reaction pattern and uh, in the anticipation that the other outputs is remaining unchanged then uh, before going into the next model we'll just take a small numerical to understand this stekelberg model so we have a demand function which p is equal to 200 minus q then cost is uh, fixed so mca and mcb is equal to 80 so p also we can say this is 200 minus uh, okay 200 minus uh, qa plus qb and what will be the revenue function of a so total revenue of a is p q a so this is 200 minus q by q a which is 200 q a okay this no minus here 200 q a uh, minus q square a minus q a q b because this q is again q a plus q b okay so total revenue of a is 200 q a minus q square a minus q a q b and for marginal revenue of a this is d t r a with respect to d q a so this is 
माइनस टू क्यू ए माइनस क्यू बी मार्जिनल कॉस्ट ऑफ ए इज इक्वल टू एटी सो इफ मार्जिनल प्रॉफिट मैक्सिमाइजिंग रूल से इज दैट मार्जिनल रेवेन्यू ऑफ ए शुड बी इक्वल टू मार्जिनल कॉस्ट ऑफ ए सो टू हंड्रेड माइनस टू क्यू ए माइनस क्यू बी शुड बी इक्वल टू एटी सो क्यू ए इज इक्वल टू सिक्सटी माइनस हाफ क्यू बी एंड दिस इज जनरली द रिएक्शन फंक्शन ऑफ रिएक्शन फंक्शन ऑफ रिएक्शन फंक्शन ऑफ ए सिमिलरली फॉर बी वी कैन फाइंड आउट क्यू बी इज इक्वल टू आई एम नॉट जस्ट गेटिंग इन टू द डिटेल ऑफ द डेरीवेशन सो क्यू बी इज इक्वल टू सिक्सटी माइनस हाफ क्यू ए दिस इज द रिएक्शन फंक्शन ऑफ दिस इज द रिएक्शन फंक्शन ऑफ बी so uh, now to solve the value of uh, q and q b we can just uh, put the value of uh, q a in equation of q b or q b in equation of q a so q a is equal to 60 minus half q b so 60 minus half 60 minus half q a this is the value of q b so simplifying this we will get q a is equal to 40 and q b also equal to 40. so q a is equal to 40, q b is equal to 40 and q has to be equal to 80 since it is q a plus q b and price is equal to 200 minus uh, q. so 200 minus uh, 80 so 120 so q is equal to 80 p is equal to 120 q a is equal to 40 and q b is equal to 40 with this demand function and cost using the stackelberg model then uh, generally how generally to solve this numerical or how to find out this profit maximizing level of output for both the firms uh, using the profit maximizing rule, we need to find out the reaction curve function for both the farms that is for uh, farm 1 and farm 2 and from there we can solve the value of uh, output that is QA, QB or Q1, Q2 just putting the value of the others and that gives us the total output in the market and also the uh, output specific to the Form. So, here typically the reaction function generally we say that this is the reaction function approach through which generally we get the individual firms output and the total market output. Then we will get into the uh, get into the discussion of kinked demand curve model and kinked demand curve model is also one form of the non collusive oligopoly model where it assumes that there is no cooperation or no collusion among the firm in case of a king demand curve model. And this model generally uh, explain us that uh, why the price is rigid for the firms and at least uh, in the oligopolist market why it changes very slowly over time. So, individual firms basically afraid to change their price because of what other firms might do. So, if one firm changes the possibility that the other firm may not do change and that is the reason they afraid to change the price and that is the reason in case of oligopoly market. Uh, maybe decreasing price is uh, not uh, so slow, but increasing price is slow because the others may not follow to this. What are uh, there are certain assumptions we take in order to understand the King demand curve model. The first one, if a firm raises price, other firms won't follow, and firm loses a lot of business. So, whenever there is an increase in the price, the other firm will not follow it automatically and that is why that firm who has raised the price, they generally lose lot of business. So, demand is very responsive or elastic to price increase and if a firm lower the price, other firm follow, but the firm does not gain much business. So, in this case, if you look at it, this part of the demand curve is inelastic because whenever one firm lowers the price, the other firm also lower the price in order to, in order to 
get more uh, get more market share or more demand and that is why in this case the change in the price is not affecting the quantity demanded of the farm much and that is why we get an inelastic demand curve. So, demand is very responsive or the elastic to increase in the price and demand is fairly unresponsive and inelastic to price decrease. So, if you look at this uh, graph, if reduced price and competitor match the price, typically if you look at now we are getting two set of the demand curve. One is the elastic demand curve, another is the inelastic demand curve. If reduced price and competitor match the price cut, then move along the inelastic demand curve that is segment D i. And if increase in the price and competitor is not following that, then we get in the segment of the elastic. So, uh, we have two kind of uh, demand curve now. One, we have a inelastic demand curve and we have a uh, elastic demand curve. So, this inelastic demand curve is when price decreases, other firm also decreases the price and elastic is the basis is that whenever there is a increase in the price, other price keep the other firm keep the price constant. So, ideally what will be the demand curve for the firm? There are two segment, one and one segment of the elastic demand curve and one segment of the inelastic demand curve. So, this segment of the elastic demand curve because because of the fact that when there were, whenever there is an increase in the price, the competitor they are not matching to it. And this part of the demand curve is one, whenever the price cut happens, the other firms or the competitor also decreasing the price. So, increase in the price, competitor price remain constant, decrease in the price, the competitor also decreasing the price. That is why the demand curve of the firm has two segment, one is the elastic segment with respect to increase in the price and other is the inelastic segment that is the with respect to decrease in the price. Uh, here to remember that decrease in the price is generally followed by the uh, competitor, but increase in the price is not followed by the competitor and that is why we get two separate segment in the demand curve, one is the elastic segment and other is the inelastic segment. So, this is generally the shape of the king demand curve, where the upper portion is elastic and the lower portion is inelastic. The upper portion is come from the elastic demand curve and in this segment, whenever there is an increase in the price, because uh, increase in the price, the competitors they are not going to follow it and the downward segment is the part of the inelastic segment, where whenever there is an increase in the uh, decrease in the pr price, competitor generally follows this. Now, how this uh, marginal revenue curve we here we get? Uh, this is the first case, this is the margin, we get also two marginal revenue curve here, because since we have two demand curve, we have two marginal revenue curve. The first segment of the marginal revenue curves comes from the top part of the demand curve, which is the elastic demand curve. So, here this marginal revenue curve is with respect to the uh, elastic segment of the demand curve. Then we will see what is the marginal revenue curve for the bottom segment and for the marginal revenue curve for the bottom segment is again it is a part of the inelastic demand curve. So, if you will find there are two marginal revenue curve with respect to two demand curve, because uh, it is one demand curve, but it has two segment, one is the elastic segment, other is other one is the inelastic segment. So, one marginal uh, revenue curve with respect to the elastic segment and the other marginal revenue curve with respect to the inelastic segment. So, this is for the bottom part of the demand curve and previously it was the top part for the demand curve. So, this is the inelastic part of the demand curve. So, this is generally the king demand curve and we have two marginal revenue curve. If you notice here, there is a gap between the two marginal revenue curve. Why there is a gap between two uh, marginal revenue curve? Because our demand curve has a kink and at the point of kink, we are not able to decide which one is the marginal revenue curve. So, if you look at demand curve is generally known as a king demand curve, because it has a kink between the two segment of the demand curve, that is between the elastic segment and inelastic segment of the demand curve. Corresponding to the elastic segment, we have one marginal revenue curve, 
Corresponding to the inelastic segment, we have another marginal revenue curve. At the corresponding to the point of kink, there is a gap between the marginal revenue curve 1 and marginal revenue curve 2. So, that is why in case of a kink demand curve, uh, the, there is a gap between the marginal revenue curve 1 and marginal revenue curve 2. Now, the question comes how the marginal cost should be because we need to get the equality between the marginal revenue and marginal cost to get the profit maximizing level of output and the marginal cost should cut which segment of the marginal revenue curve whether the segment related to the elastic demand curve or whether the segment related to the inelastic demand curve. So, marginal cost generally intersect the um, uh, marginal revenue curve in the gap in the vertical segment in the gap between the marginal revenue 1 and marginal revenue 2 and uh, whenever there is an increase in the marginal cost if the cost shift up slightly, but marginal cost still intersect the marginal revenue in the vertical segment there will be no change in the price. Because if any point of time if marginal cost goes to marginal revenue 1 that is elastic segment or to the inelastic segment still it will not consider as for the whole demand curve whole king demand curve and that is why you will find there is a price rigidity and this is the outcome of the price rigidity that we get two level of marginal revenue curve and the marginal cost curve is not going for the marginal revenue 1 or marginal revenue 2 rather it is in the gap. So, even if there is an increase in the cost still the firm is not changing the price because if it is changing the price again it may lead to a situation that the other firm will not follow it and they will get into the loss. So, King demand model generally it provides the explanation detailed description of firm under oligopoly and it explains the various characteristics such as price rigidity, why there is a indeterminate demand curve, non price competition and independent decision making. But it, this model fails to explain a basic question how price is determined because it is it's, it's really a fudgy when the price is decided in the uh, uh, gap in the vertical segment between marginal revenue 1 and marginal revenue 2. And that is why this model has a criticized on the ground that it fails to explain the basic question of any model that how the price and output is determined. Because we have a king demand curve, we have two level of marginal revenue curve that is marginal revenue 1 and marginal revenue 2. So, we will just take a uh, uh, numerical to understand that when you take a numerical, when you take a real production function, when we take a real demand function cost function, whether we get the gap between the marginal revenue 1 and marginal revenue 2 with respect to two different demand and how, whether the marginal cost also pass through the vertical segment or the gap between the marginal revenue 1 and marginal revenue 2. So, we will take uh, two demand function, we will take H q 1. and we will take as q 2. So, we have two de, uh, demand function one is 28 minus 4 p 1 and second is 10 minus p 2. We will take a total cost function that is 1 4 q square plus q plus 50 and we need to find out the marginal revenue, marginal revenue for both the firms marginal cost price output and we need to say what is the upper and lower limit of MR because that will tell us whether there is a vertical segment or gap between marginal revenue or not and whether MC falls in the gap of 2 MR or not. Okay. So, to start with we will find out since we have q 1 is equal to 28 minus 4 p 1, we will find p 1 is equal to 7 minus 1 by 4 q 1, q 2 is equal to 10, min, uh, 10 minus p 2. So, p 2 is equal to 10 minus q 2. Total revenue 1 is p 
1 q 1. So, that comes to 7 q 1 minus 1 by 4 q 1 square and total revenue on corresponding to this we will get the marginal revenue 1 that is 7 minus half q 1. Uh, similarly, total revenue 2 is P 2 Q 2. So, this is 10 Q 2 minus Q 2 square. Marginal revenue 2 is 10 minus 2 Q 2 Q 2 and we have now marginal revenue 1, we have now marginal revenue 2. We will find out the marginal cost from our total cost function. So, total cost function is 1 4 uh, q square plus q plus 50. So, marginal cost will come as 1 plus half q and uh, if you look at, at the king at the point of king both the demand curve should uh, intersect and to get this intersection we have to do a is equal to q is equal to q 1 plus q 1 equal to q 2. So, 7 uh, minus 1 4 q is equal to 10 q. So, q is equal to 4 and p is equal to 6. So, taking the value of uh, q and p marginal revenue 1 is equal to 7 minus half into 4 that is equal to 5. Marginal revenue 2 is equal to 10 minus 2.4. So, that is 2. So, marginal revenue 1 is 5, marginal revenue 2 is 2. Now, we need to find out M c. So, M c is equal to 1 plus half uh, q. So, this comes to 1 plus half multiplied by 4. So, this comes to 3. So, we can say that q is equal to 4, this is the output, p is equal to 6, we have uh, first segment of m r is equal to 5, the value of second segment of m r is equal to 2 and m c is equal to 3. So, we can also prove that the m c falls in the gap of two level of m r that is marginal revenue 1 and marginal revenue 2. So, today we discuss about uh, typical in this session we discuss about the Carnot model. Stackelberg model and King demand curve model and all these three models are part of non collusive uh, oligopoly model. In the next session, we will di discuss about the collusive oligopoly model, typically the cartels and the price leadership model.